We've gathered today to honor a great man, a loving husband, and father, grandfather, dedicated servant to both his family and his Lord. On behalf of the family, can I just say thank you for, for coming? I know some of you have traveled a lot of miles to be here to, to honor Bob and, uh, and to be a part of the celebration of life uh, with his family. Thank you for coming. We're going to share Bob's life verse later, but I, I happen to know what Sharon's life verse is as well. And I think it's especially relevant in these moments. It comes from Lamentations 3. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. Today and in the days to follow, we'll grieve. There may be moments when the loss may feel overwhelming, but we are reminded today that when we are faced with the tremendous emotion of loss, we know that all is not lost. We are not consumed. In fact, we remember God's faithfulness and his mercy today. We know where Bob is because the scripture has made it clear that for those who put their faith in Christ, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And therefore we grieve, but as the scriptures say, we don't grieve as those who have no hope. And so today, not only do we honor a wonderful man, but we honor the one who made him wonderful. We honor Jesus, his Savior, the Son of God, who died and rose again and who will return and will bring with him those who have died in him. So we weep and we worship. Both are appropriate today. And as important as music was to Bob, it seems appropriate that we celebrate Bob and worship his Lord and ours with singing today. So let's invite God to be present, and let's worship him today. Lord Jesus, we have come into your presence today, recognizing that we are in need of you to be present with us today. We're thankful, Lord, for for the life that has been lived ahead of us, in front of us. And Lord, we... Today, want to honor Bob, your servant, your child, and we want to honor you, Jesus, for the life that you have given to us, to, as someone to, to not only observe, but somebody to teach us, someone whose life has reflected the image of Christ. So, Lord, I pray that today we would have ears to hear what your spirit would say to us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We invite you, if you're able, to stand with us and sing.
story of Christ and his love. Tell of his power to forgive. Others will trust him if only you prove true every moment you live. Make me a blessing.
fight life's fight no war with pain and then as death gives way to victory I'll see the light of glory and I'll know he lives because he lives I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gone because I know I know he holds the future and life is worth a living just because affliction he had with his mercy to multiply trials his multiplied peace his love has no limit his grace has no measure his power has no boundary no Bob served, of course, uh, the Church of the Nazarene for many years, and upon the news of his passing, um, one of our general superintendents, David Busick, uh, sent a letter. I would like to read that. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. On behalf of the Board of General Superintendents, I extend deep sympathy and prayers in the death of Robert Kilpatrick. We are sorry for your loss, and yet we join in the celebration of his well-lived life. The Lord Jesus promised us that he is the resurrection and the life, and God's word assures us that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Robert has fully realized that hope. 
Robert gave more than 35 years of service for Christ and the Church of the Nazarene as a devoted and caring pastor. His ministry extended to serving as chaplain for law enforcement. His gift for music brought joy to so many, and his patient teaching turned children into budding musicians. Only heaven will reveal all the lives he touched and the influence of his faithful service. Sharon, Lance, Ryan, extended family and friends, we rejoice with you in the legacy of faith, hope, and love that your husband, dad, pastor, and friend leaves behind. I pray the Lord's comfort and sustaining grace will be yours as you remember the promise of the resurrection and the reality that you will someday join him again in the new creation. Grace and peace, David A. Busick. Certain that we could all give some sort of tribute this morning. Uh, we are going to hear uh, from the family and, uh, and, and some others uh, through the family uh, in notes of tribute. Lance. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming, for being so generous with your time, being so caring and kind with your cards and condolences to me and my family. We thank you. Thank you for everyone who came here today and for those who are watching online and for sharing your stories and tributes for my dad. My dad led a remarkable life, and that's what we remember today. There's pain in losing him, and it runs deep. But there's also joy and celebration in his life that was. He, in his abundance of love and service, touched many people more than we'll ever know. And today we celebrate that. Today I'll reference him as dad, but most of you know him as Bob or Pastor Bob. His story began at Castle Air Force Base in Central California. He was born to Earl and Sidna. He was the first born and after five sisters, he was the only son. Dad grew up bouncing from military base to military base, from California to England, to New Mexico, back to California, to Michigan, to Washington. My dad bragged all the time about moving around. I can hear him saying, I was in 13 schools in 12 years. To him, it wasn't considered a disadvantage, but more of an adventure. It was while he was living in Traverse City, Michigan, that my dad took to shoe shining to make some money. He was in the fourth grade, and as the story goes, he shined enough shoes to earn his way to Indian Lake Nazarene Campground. It was there at the stone altar that my dad gave his life to Jesus Christ. Another story that my dad liked to tell was when he turned 12 years old. While his dad was serving with the Air Force in Vietnam, my dad's uncles and cousins took him, took him on a snowy backpacking slash hunting trip on the outskirts of Yosemite in California. The guys rode horses and my dad got to ride a pony. And there's lots of details of the story, right? There was a lot of snow and there were donkeys and it was a great adventure that he, he loved to remember and to tell. With all the moving around early in his life, there were three things that remained constant. Church, church camp, and his trumpet. After dad graduated from high school, he decided to go to Olivet, which he said was just really a long continuation of summer camp. <laughs> he loved music and he loved the band room, so studying music education was the obvious choice. And it was at Olivet on a fateful Wednesday in Wisner Auditorium during Prof Collins' fine arts class that my dad, who was running a little bit late, was looking for a seat in a full auditorium. Wouldn't you know, the only seat was, was next to the love of his life, my mom, Sharon. Thus began 50 years of memories, 47 of those years as a married couple.
Following graduation, my mom and dad, they moved to Cheyenne, Wyoming, so that my mom could repay the hospital for the scholarship that they had given her. While in Cheyenne, my dad was in constant demand to be a substitute teacher, usually in band and wood shop. Dad loved to tell the story of his first, his first long-term teaching assignment, where he spent three months in a one-room schoolhouse with nine children, ages kindergarten through eighth grade. And then it was in Cheyenne where my dad and my mom started a family when my older brother, Ryan, was born. My dad's dad, Grandpa Earl, had returned from Vietnam with a call to the ministry. He was now a pastor in Oregon and needed someone to lead the music. So naturally, my dad moved his young family to Hood River, Oregon to help out. It was there that the Lord provided my dad with a full-time music teacher position, a position that my dad adored. He was responsible for all the children, kindergarten through high school, beginning band through advanced band. A memory that both my mom and dad share was when they produced and directed the musical, The Wizard of Oz. According to my dad, third graders make perfect munchkins, <laughs> and the high schoolers, they carried the lead parts. While in Hood River, I entered into the picture. My mom and dad bought their first home, and we moved across the river to Carson, Washington. But this is where the plot takes a turn. Right when you think that this young family would start to dig deep roots, my dad goes backpacking into the Wallow Mountains. And while on the mountaintop, he settled with the Lord, his call to pastoral ministry. But God didn't just call my dad into ministry. When my dad returned from the mountains to tell my mom about his call to the ministry, she already knew. God had been preparing her as well. So pack the truck again, we're moving to Colorado, so my dad could attend Nazarene Bible College. The rest of my dad's life, my mom and dad would serve the Lord in ministry, and if there's one thing that we can learn from his life, it's what faithful service means. Faithfully serving the Lord for my dad meant leaving his kids in teaching music to prepare to be a pastor. Second, it meant answering the call to Little Falls, Minnesota to lead a small Nazarene church where the Swedes sat on one side of the aisle and the Norwegians on the other side. <laughs> it meant moving your family to a drafty farmhouse where the landlord cut you a deal if you'd take care of the animals that also lived on the property. Little Falls was far from luxurious, but God always provided. Third, it meant answering another call to another small church in Loomis, California. It meant preparing a sermon and opening the doors of the church on a Sunday night for the chance that one family might show up. But if not, Dad would load us into the car and we would drive to the neighboring town to catch a Sunday evening service at the Lincoln Nazarene Church. And occasionally, we would go over to Scott and Wendy's after church and watch MASH reruns. <laughs> in order to meet, make the ends meet in Loomis, my dad needed to be bivocational. So my dad took a position as a law enforcement chaplain at Placer County Sheriff's Department. This was not only extra income, but it gave my dad an outlet to faithfully serve. Being a police chaplain for the county was difficult work between Sundays. My dad was called to be a light and to share the love of Jesus to victims, to suffering families, and also to the police officers. It was from those experiences that my dad wrote a training manual for the law enforcement chaplains that would end up being used throughout the international chaplaincy for police chaplains. After eight years in Loomis, God needed my dad to move again and his family to San Jose to pastor Cambrian Park Church of the Nazarene, a church where my dad would serve as lead pastor. And almost every day for 20 plus years, my dad would make his way down to the church preschool where every child in that preschool knew and would yell out, Pastor Bob! God had given him his kids back. And my dad would sit on the floor with the kids. He would console the, the, the crying child. Or one of his favorite pastimes was to circle the children up and read a picture book from his collection of picture books. My dad, he touched many people. From those kids in that one-room schoolhouse, to the third grade munchkins, to the scarecrow, to the tin man, to the Swedes and the Norwegians, to those children that he read books to, 
to those that he baptized in a pool or in a river or even those who were happily baptized in a horse trough. To those people he led, to those people that he led to the Lord, to the kids he drove to camp. To those who would just wander into the church looking for a pastor. To those who spoke Spanish or those who spoke Haitian or those who spoke Korean. Or to those like Daniel or Joey who received their call to the ministry under him. He certainly touched me, my brother, my mom. He touched his grandkids, Owen, Callie, Robert, Lene, and Ryan. God called my dad to serve, and he served faithfully. Paul put it this way in Philippians 2, 3, and 8, 3 through 5. He wrote, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others better than yourself. Don't look out for your own interests, but take on the interest of others. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. My dad touched many people more than we'll ever know. And today, we celebrate that. Thank you.
Good morning. Thank you all for coming. For those who don't know, I was Bob's oldest son, Ryan. Over the past couple of weeks since my dad's passing, we have all appreciated the stories, memories, and tributes that have been shared of my dad. We would have loved to share them all, but for your sake, we've only selected a few, each one from a special person representing a different time in his life. From Chris Ryan, from when dad was a teen, she wrote, I met Bob at Indian Lake Nazarene Camp in Michigan as a young teen. We shared many camps together. Then he started dating my Olivet roommate, Sharon Hildy. She kept dating him, even though I told her all about him and his pranks at Indian Lake. <laughs> we held a deputation service for them in San Jose. Always a blessing to be with them and the boys. Wish we could be there with you during this time. Our thoughts and prayers are with you. From Mike Quimby, as dad began his journey into the pastoral ministry, he wrote, it was my first day at Bible College in Colorado Springs. Being new to Colorado and even newer to Bible College, I hadn't had a chance to meet anyone and yet in the classes personally. One day I was busy looking at the assignments when someone tall in stature came up beside me and said, hey, you are from Canyon City, aren't you? I, he said, my name is Bob Kilpatrick and I heard someone else would be coming to the college from Canyon City. I live there and drive up here every day. I wondered if you'd like to share rides with me. That was the beginning of a great and meaningful friendship. Immediately, I recognized Bob was one of the kindest men I had ever met and seemed like he knew no strangers. During our long daily commute through the winding mountains, we began to share our visions for the ministry. After a few months of riding back and forth, we also discussed possible ways that we could bring in some extra money for our families. We both had small children at the time. Many times, Bob's two small blonde-headed boys would stand in the seat in the pickup between Bob and me as we made the commute. At times, we would ride together around town on Saturdays looking for possible help wanted signs for someone needing extra help. We drove past this beautiful factory outside of Canyon City every day and would com comment to each other how they needed someone to give that place some landscaping help. Bob said, I've got an extra mower. Let's just stop and see if they would be interested in us taking care of the yards around the factory. It was full of cacti and briars, and the ground underneath was hidden entirely. Bob went to the door, introduced himself to the owner. The owner was impressed that we would want to take the job on. He took us up on our offer to clean it up. We would come home after school, put on our landscaping clothes and gloves, make our way back to the factory with blisters on our hands from the thistles and cacti that developed quickly. And it didn't take long for us to convince the power that we were hard workers. We soon had that yard giving the factory excellent curb appeal from the highway. The owner was so pleased, he asked us to consider taking on his home yard also. It was a great blessing as we lived on very little during college. Through the years, Bob and my friendship continued to grow stronger as we shared over the phone both our victories and challenges in our churches. He has always been a spiritual giant in my eyes. He left Bible college before me and began pastoring, but our friendship continued through the years. I counted him as one of my closest friends in the ministry, and when we moved, they moved here, I was looking forward to some great fellowship in our retirement. He will be sorely missed. From Annette Tennant, a member from Dad's most recent church, Cambrian Park, she wrote, Pastor Bob, I have so many great memories. A few of my favorites were when Sharon and I got you lost, sort of, on our way to district assembly, and somehow, only God, helped us find our way after all. Or while attending one of my first district assemblies, and we were taking communion, and my little cup sort of exploded all over us. We were definitely covered in the blood of Jesus. <laughs> all kidding aside, you taught me so much about my faith in Jesus too, and how to be a good parent. You've prayed with me upstairs in your office so many times. You helped me pray Rob home from the army. I will never forget you, Pastor Bob. My life is truly blessed having you in it. Until we meet again, PB. Love you. From the Riggs family, who also attended the Cambrian Park Church, Candace wrote, Pastor Bob dedicated our three beautiful children to the Lord. When he picked up our middle son, Jacob, he said, Oh my, you're a tank made everyone laugh as our sweet Jacob is a very sturdy little guy. Pastor Bob was such a man of God and always had a wonderful heart and open arms at the church. We always, was always there to listen and guide you. He never judged anyone. He was truly a shining light. 
I can only imagine how beautiful a moment was when he met our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May you dance forever in heaven, watching over your loved ones and your church family. We love and miss you dearly, Pastor Bob. From Larry and Mary Holder, who met Bob after he retired and started to attend this church in Mantino, they wrote, We sat behind Bob and Sharon in church every Sunday. We came to love and appreciate them both. It was a running joke that Larry would snap Bob's suspenders every Sunday. Bob got to accompany me twice for preludes on his trumpet and seemed to enjoy it so much in spite of his COPD. We will miss him and his vivacious personality, but know he is rejoicing with the Lord he loves so much. When you get my age, folks, you can choose where you want to speak. I did. You know, it says I'm going to read the 23rd Psalms. You're going to have to fill the gaps if I get this thing open. You know, <clears throat> David wrote the 23rd Psalm for those that were living in that day. <clears throat> We've heard a lot about Bob's walk here on earth, haven't we? He really had quite a life. This is today, let's raise our thinking a little bit. Let's take our thinking towards heaven. Let's listen reverently to a rendition, mine, of the 23rd Psalm. Today, 11 October, that's the day that Bob passed away. The Lord is my shepherd. He's provided all my needs. He holds me by his hand as we walk through pastures green. Today we sit down beside the quiet waters. He's restored my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness, all for his namesake. Yes, we did walk through a dark valley. But Christ, my shepherd, was right beside me. His staff and his rod were my comfort. Here in heaven, the banquet table is set always for the honored guests. In the presence of my loved ones who preceded me, my head was anointed with oil. And I'm no longer afflicted today. My cup runneth over with joy. <clears throat> Surely, goodness and mercy and his love is with me as I live in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever. I would like to leave a scripture with my family. I hope you have a favorite favorite, but this is mine. Get my glasses out. It's Isaiah 41.10. He says, I could quote it, but I want to make sure and get it right. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for
for I am thy God. How can we go wrong when we got that behind us? We got him with us. I will strengthen thee. Yes, I will help thee. I will uphold you with my right, with my right hand of my righteousness. What a promise. I hope you can dig that out and memorize it, family. Fear thou not. God is with you. Amen. I'd sing a song this afternoon, but you don't want to hear it. It would be what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saves me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through that promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. And I want you to know something on the side that has nothing to do with this service. I've appreciated his ministry. He's been talking about heaven. Amen. What a blessing to hear these stories. Um, Bob's life verse is printed in the folder that you received. Hopefully you got one of those. Revelation 3, 8 is contained within one of the seven letters written to seven, I'm going to say preachers, to seven churches. In praying about how to best honor Bob and to honor his God, it seemed appropriate to take a look at this letter this morning. To the angel, or to the messenger, that's the word there, the messenger of the church would be the preacher. To the preacher of the church in Philadelphia, write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David, what he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. He's saying these are the words of Jesus, the King of kings, the one greater than King David, the one who holds as King David held the keys to all of Jerusalem. King Jesus holds the keys to all the new Jerusalem. And he says these words. Here's his life verse. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Revelation 3, 8 directed Bob's steps for life. If Jesus was opening a door, Bob was walking through it. Jesus, if Jesus was shutting a door, I think... He knew he needed to be reminded not to throw his weight against that door to try to force it open. I'm convinced that Bob did his best to recognize the doors that the Lord was opening and the doors that the Lord was shutting and to faithfully follow his call. Some might look at Bob's path and, and question, a music degree? Then music ministry and a music teacher and then back to Bible college after he had a family, earning a, a second degree, moving his, his family all over the country, working as a, as a pastor and as a law enforcement chaplain. You know, I, I have to say I have a special place in my heart for those who are in bivocational ministry. Those that take on two jobs, really it feels like two full-time jobs, but you don't get paid for one of them, right? Why would you do that? Why, why would anyone do that if it weren't a calling? And then to San Jose, California, right? Who, who goes to California? <laughs> what do you think he was thinking, you know? Bob tuned in 
to hear God's voice. It was his pursuit, his life's pursuit. Whether he turned to the east or the wild west, he heard a voice behind him saying, this is the way, walk in it. He made it his practice to walk through every door that God opened for him. But sometimes the doors that Jesus opens don't lead to the most pleasant places. Isn't that true? Sometimes it can be scary. History tells us that the city of Philadelphia was plagued with earthquakes. Something a California like Bob could relate to probably. Maybe that's why he picked that as his life verse. I don't know. Sometimes the, the doors God calls us to walk through can threaten to rattle us a bit. Things were unsettled in the city of brotherly love. And apparently, Philadelphia wasn't without a problem church. Listen to how it's described. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan... <laughs> who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. That's how the church is described there. Wouldn't you love to be the pastor of that appointment? It sounds like a tough placement to me. I hope Bob never had a, a problem church like that or problem people in a church like that, but most pastors have, <laughs> says one who was a pastor. <laughs> it might not have been the perfect church, but the message to the messenger of that church at Philadelphia was, be faithful. Be faithful. And God will deal with them, <laughs> is, is the rest of it. It goes on, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, doesn't that just feel good? Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. Those troublemakers will one day fall at the pastor's feet in apology. Never <laughs> one day. But see, the, the point of this is it's not today. One day, that'll, but it's not today. Today is not that day. Today it's hard. Today the message to the messenger is simply, hold on. I am coming soon, Jesus says. Hold on to what you have so that no one can take your crown. Sometimes that work that he has given to us to do is not received well by others. But Bob was a faithful servant of Christ. Aren't you thankful? He didn't let the trouble of life or the troublemakers in life trip him up, slow him down. But he could say with Paul, I believe he could say with Paul, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. I'm sure it wasn't just the pastoral ministry or, or, or trying to work two jobs that required faithful endurance. Sharon, I know you were blessed to have a man stand by you through a stroke, through cancer, seven major surgeries, five of which were cancer-related. When Jesus leads us over a threshold into hard work and long and emotionally difficult days that we're not sure we even have the strength for, the reminder is, hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. When we feel strength is sapped, aren't those the times we know a deeper dependence on the one who is our strength? On those days, I believe Bob would, would hear Jesus' encouragement. I know that you have little strength. That's his life verse, right? I know you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. There are some people in Christ's church that are not only faithful to God, but supportive of the faith of others. They not only hold on to the faith, but they hold up our faith. We sometimes call them pillars 
of the faith or pillars in the church. Bob was like that. They take the burdens of the church to heaven in prayer. They make the difficult decisions that the church needs to make in order to remain unshakable when society seems to be crumbling all around. The pillars of the church often remain in the background and unnoticed. They may feel weak, like everything is coming in on them. But their work of standing firm and strong in the faith, that work is essential. Bob was like that. He not only held on to the faith, but he strengthened our faith. And only heaven will be able to tell how many people came to trust Christ because of the faithfulness of Pastor Bob. How many consecrated their lives to the sanctifying work of the Lord in their lives. Were strengthened in their faith because of his encouragement. How many will be granted entrance into heaven because he held on and he stood firm. <laughs> and to the pillars in the church, the message continues. It says this, The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. For the one who had little strength but kept God's word and didn't deny his name, the door is open to the place of God's eternal presence, and he stands unshakable in the very presence of God forever. Never again will he leave God's presence. Bob Kilpatrick stood as a pillar in our presence and now stands as a pillar in the presence of God. Isn't that exceptional? I want to say something to the family here. If your name is Kilpatrick, you have a wonderful heritage. Grandpa Earl Kilpatrick has passed his name onto Robert Kilpatrick. Sharon took that name, Kilpatrick, and the name was passed to Ryan and Lance, Angie and Amy took on the name. And now Owen and Callie and Lene and Robert and Ryan carry the name Kilpatrick. You are a Kilpatrick. And it's more than a really cool Irish name or Scottish name. I don't know what it is. A little bit of both. It's a connection. It's a connection to those who have carried the name that is above every other name. Do you hear that? The Kilpatricks. They have a heritage to carry God's name. Jesus tells the messenger of the church of Philadelphia, I will write on them, those who hold on, stand firm. He says, I will write the name of my God in the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on them my new name. The hope we have today is that Bob has taken the name of God and his Lord Jesus Christ. He's been marked as God's own forever, made a citizen of heaven, guaranteed a resurrection and entrance into the city of his God. As a church, the last four weeks, we have been talking about what it is to be citizens of heaven. Last week, I thought I was finishing that series up. We talked about how the new Jerusalem comes out of heaven, set up, prepared for those who have taken the name of Christ, who have washed the robes in baptism and the cleansing of his Holy Spirit, who walk in relationship with the one who died for our sins, was buried in our death, was raised to life, that we might live with him and like him. We have a sure and certain hope 
of resurrection. So this series was already in the works when when Bob passed away. And I questioned if I should just put the series on the back burner for later. But I chose not to. And as God would have it, we started the series the Sunday after Bob passed away. And then the memorial service was set a month out. And for four weeks, we have considered and celebrated the reality that is Bob's because of Jesus. Again, I thought the series ended last Sunday. Then Sharon shared with me Bob's life verse. I said, I got to preach it. This message to the church of Philadelphia beautifully reminds us of our hope of the resurrection as citizens of heaven, awaiting this new heavenly city. But this message is not merely about Bob. They are for us. These words are for us. We worship today, but today isn't easy. We miss Bob. So how do you respond? We live as he did. We follow the one who has the master key to every door. Who knows, he knows you have little strength. Nevertheless, live according to his word Don't deny his name, endure patiently, hold on, stand firm, take Christ's name. Live as Bob did. And one day, Jesus will stand between you and the gates of heaven and say, I know your deeds. See, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, that you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Come and share your master's happiness. On the other side of that door, pain and death will be no more. Tears will be washed away and we will enjoy the eternal presence of Jesus and the renewed fellowship with Bob and others who have put their trust in Christ. Jesus says, I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus, thank you for meeting with us today. We have done our best to honor Bob, to celebrate his life, And to honor and celebrate his Lord. And Jesus, now we we say we need you. We need you to be for us what we cannot be in our own strength. We have little strength. God, help us to hold on. Help us, Lord, not not to lay down that crown. (laughs) <laughs> quite yet, to hold on. Lord, help us to, to be students of your word and to walk through every open door that you point us to. Help us to endure patiently. Help us, Lord, in this life to prepare for the life to come. Grant us your comfort in these days. For Sharon and for Lance and Ryan and all of this family, I pray, God. I pray for Earl. Lord, be close to them. Hold them up, we pray. We're thankful for the hope that we have. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for coming.